your life, Leila. Perfect. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody and welcome to our session today. Um, the session is Sustainable Recovery Through Sustainable Fashion and we have a fantastic group of panellists here today. Um, my name is Leila Petrie, I'm the CEO of the advisory organisation 2050, I'm also former Joint Charter of the Fashion Institute Charter for Climate Action um, and the technical consultant on Textiles for UNEP. So I will be your moderator today. Um, and we have a jam-packed agenda. So the first speaker I'd like to invite is Hossein Farai, uh, the head of the office in Geneva, to make opening remarks. Okay. Unfortunately, Hossein is having a difficulty logging on, so I will be making opening remarks in his stead. So my name is Nina Arden. I'm the senior consultant for the ENG Secretariat. And um, we're here today, apologize, one more second. Thank you for joining us today uh, for the EMG Nexus Dialogue. And we know that fashion and its related industries, textiles, apparel, leather, and footwear is responsible for eight to 10% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And for the usage of chemicals found harmful to the environment and human health. So its value chain has a global revenue worth 2.5 trillion, leading Stockholm Plus 50 and the UNEP report, Sustainability and Circularity in the Textile Value Chain, to conclude the sustainable fashion has the potential to support HLPS 2021 theme of sustainable recovery for all. By applying the precautionary principle to the sustainable management of environmental dimensions of its value chain, including conscientious product design, natural resources, material inputs, workers' health, well-being, treatment of waste and end of life product disposal in pursuit of circularity, its stakeholders and influencing industries can turn this drive towards circularity into a significant avenue for a just transition. The colleagues surrounding us today are all experts in this field. So today's dialogue provides an opportunity to facilitate an exchange of different approaches to address the environmental facets of the sustainable fashion nexus in pursuit of a sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 context with an emphasis on new and system programs. In today's Nexus Dialogue, we are pleased to welcome key opening interventions from our champions on sustainable fashion and representatives from the UN Alliance for Sustainable Fashion, ITC Ethical Fashion Initiative, UNEP, UNCDAT, UNECE, UNESCO, UNFCCC, and ILO who will present on updated key initiatives relating to sustainable fashion after which we will welcome a moderated free-flowing discussion involving colleagues within the UN system, private sector champions, civil society, and policymakers. And I thank you once again for your attendance, contribution, and wish you a very successful dialogue. Leila, over to you. Thank you very much. So um, I think I will now hand straight over to uh, Mr. Simone Cipriani, um, who is the chairperson of the UN Alliance for Sustainable Fashion and head of ITC Ethical Fashion Initiative. Thank you, Simone. Hey, thanks, Laila. Thanks, Nina. Uh, we all know, hi, hi, everybody. We all know that the value every industry, every economic activity generates is a function of the capital invested in it. And we know very well uh, how to use financial capital. We have tools, accounting, financial reports to measure the value or the loss created. And the owners of these financial capital shareholders are very, very, very careful about it. And they're very serious on reporting on how it is used. But there are two other forms of capital that are employed in this industry, social and environmental capital. And often they are employed in such a way Way that this employment, the way in which they are used, generates a loss for the owners of this capital, which is society as a whole. So there is an asymmetry. On one side, you have the owners of financial capital, the shareholders who generate a profit. And on the other side, you have the owners of the, fine, of the environmental and social capital who receive a loss. We have to change this. This changes, first of all, by starting, and this is a general trend to report seriously on ESG, on the way in which we use 
this final, this environmental and the social capital. But reporting is just the end of the story. Transparency on what we do is the end of the story. The real point is to use this, and now we, I will focus on environment as this is the topic of today, the way in which we use the environmental capital to avoid generating losses through its use. And, uh, and on this, we know the industry has adopted a lot of strategies. They, they do a lot of offsetting. I try to, to, to compensate for the losses I generate, but we know this is just a temporary measure. There is a serious uh, investment in decarbonization, which is to say, I avoid creating these losses, but this does not work without also a push on circularity, which is to say what I take, I put back. And, uh, and this is an extremely important point because circularity is the connecting point in between the social and the environmental capital. We do circularity in the usage of inputs, water and so on, but also circularity in the use of products. And here circularity means many things, lending, sharing, repurposing and so on. But circularity also has an implication on the way in which labor is organized. Uh, you create labor in a place, but you destroy labor in another place. So circularity is a very important tool for the protection of our environmental capital and to generate a, a gain for society as a whole. But we have to be sure that the way in which it is put into practice doesn't generate a loss in another form of capital, which is social capital. I think if we approach the issue of sustainability uh, from the point of view of the capital employed in the industry, we have a clear way to advocate for sustainability. And this is also reflected today by the way in which rating agencies are organizing themselves to rate important companies, all companies. You have now financial ratings and sustainability ratings that are becoming as important as financial ratings. This is why we are involved in an ambitious project on an ESG due diligence and corporate reporting thing, but I will speak about this later. I hope I was brief and short enough, Laila. Very efficient. Thank you very much, Simone. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, now we will turn to our next speaker. Um, so we now have comments from Ms. Sophia Yang, who's the Executive Director of Threading Change. Welcome, Sophia. Hey, Leila, thanks so much for having me. I'm gonna wait for the screen sharing to start. Awesome. Can everyone hear and also see me okay? Loud and clear. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Sophia Yang. It's a pleasure to be here today representing youth and dis discussing our view and outlook on sustainable fashion for these opportunities didn't used to exist. Next slide. In December, 2019, I attended the United Nations Climate Change Conference COP25 as a youth delegate, where I was an audience member at the one year anniversary signing of the UN Fashion Charter. Seeing that there was no youth representation upon a stage, I told myself that I was set out to change that. In late 2020, I launched Threading Change, we are a youth-led ethical fashion not-for-profit organization working to embed intersectionality, circularity, and also equity in the fashion industry. Next slide. We envision a future where fashion is ethical and circular, rooted in justice with climate, gender, and racial equity at the forefront. Our mission drives us every day, the six Fs, working for a feminist, fossil fuel-free fashion future. We're blessed with a diverse and hardworking youth team with 10 volunteers, three staff members, and four board members from all across the globe, which you'll see their faces pull up in just a moment on the next slide. Our work really touches on the intersections of consumer education and industry transformation through our tri-impact model of education, innovative storytelling, and also policy research. Next slide. Education through our international webinar series, Textile Talks, we will, we have, where we had hundreds of attendees in 20 plus countries, ranging from elementary students to seniors to have, to, who have tuned into the webinars. We also provide sustainability, SDGs integration, equity and decolonization consulting and training to brands and institutions driving change within the industry. The second pillar we're working on is a global story map um, and storytelling program, we'll talk about later. 
And the last pillar we're working on is our SDG Synergy Ambassadors Program. We're linking fashion scholars with those doing equity and policy research. Next slide. When we were asked to deliver the key opening intervention from the youth perspective today, we knew that we had to reach out to our wide network and conduct a survey and study what youth really think about the study, the state of fashion. And so the Global Youth on Fashion Survey was born. For one month, we gathered the youth perspective aged 18 to 30 regarding the importance of the growing sustainable fashion movement. Next slide. You can see a demographic report right here. We have 206 youth from 36 countries fill the survey, representing seven continents and 20 plus youth organizations. Next slide. When it comes to youth engagement on sustainable fashion, those in your younger generation are very well versed, with 84% saying that they felt their understanding of sustainable fashion is good to excellent. This makes sense since it was real that revealed that 67% of young people think about the environmental and social consequences of fashion on it from a daily to weekly basis, with 69% of youth having made changes since COVID hit. Next slide. When asked what issue young people think we need to change the most, environmental dimensions were the most popular one by far, with many saying fashion carbon footprint emissions, 4% saying packaging materials, 30% saying all of the above, and also 33% of people saying social issues were a top choice. Next slide. It's very important for threatening change and youth from around the world to know that we, do not for, we cannot forget the social dimensions of the fashion industry. For sustainable coverage of any kind cannot happen without acknowledgement of the true inequity that exists in the industry. This powerful photo by Fashion Revolution says it all. There will not be sustainable recovery and revolution without community and human-based recovery. Next slide. A whopping 40% of survey respondents also said that they experienced greenwashing and also performative activism by brands on a daily to weekly basis, and they do not feel adequately represented in the fashion industry. The key takeaways from our survey, when you can see on the next slide, is that circularity is selected as a number one solution to combat our current fast fashion problem, getting 48% of the votes. Sustainable production com consumption were amongst the top votes as well, as well as decarbonization and moving away from fossil fuels. What's also interesting is that the social dimensions listed as fair and equitable labor and also de decent economic work and growth and touching on all pro sustainability, people also feel very strongly about. But when it comes to who's responsible, while 67% say it's most of us, and all of us, only 0.019% said the responsibility was solely on the consumer, with most saying that the responsibility has to be on the policymakers and also governments and also brands. As leaders and decision makers in the industry, we all play a main role. We cannot let our current fashion ecosystem operate in this way. We cannot allow the waters in Bangladesh, Bangladesh to be polluted any further and for modern slavery to keep happening. You go on the next slide, what's more interesting is that uh, focus on small to medium enterprises and also extend producer responsibility policy and also structural legislation on fair labor is all something that you thought as great solutions. 23% of respondents also said that storytelling and sharing best practices is an often an overlooked solution. Well, threading changes global innovation story map is a visualization toolkit that further advances storytelling, showcasing some of the most exemplified brands of the highest ethical standards. We'll be taking these brand stories to conferences such as COP26 and 27 to help increase our visibility and get connected to more investors. We're pleased to launch the map at this is World Circular Economic Forum. So this is what we're doing as young people in the industry eager to create change. So now the question is to you, what are you doing as industry leaders? To get in touch, you can reach out to us at hello at threadingchange.org. I look forward to connecting with you and threading change with you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sophia. I think some fantastically interesting stats that I personally would like to <laughs> learn more about and follow up with you on. Um, brilliant. So now we're going to welcome our next speaker, um, Ms. Sylvie Bernard, who's the chair of the Paris Good Fashion. Welcome, Sylvie. Always the sound is better. Hello to all of you. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity, this pleasure and honor to speak with you today. Um, as you said, I'm the chairwoman of Paris Good Fashion. It is an association of 100 members, uh, brands, retailers, fashion schools, federation, designers, NGO institution. Daily, we work to improve and transform the practices of fashion companies whose activity are strongly linked with Paris. We have developed evaluation tools, working groups to make progress on the major development themes. Our mission focuses on concrete actions the sharing of good practices and collective intelligence. That's why we collaborate with a lot of NGOs like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the Fashion Pack, the Fashion Greener, Black Hazard, and, and a lot of other ones. 
With the explosion in the last 30 years of fast fashion, the impact on climate, biodiversity, water pollution of the fashion industry have been increased dramatically, and you all know this. The problem is that this quantification has not yet been properly done. Reports have been published, a lot of them, but with quantification of impact ranging from one to five. The organization Climate Change had published a report that you can easily find on the internet. It's called the Global Synthesis Report on Climate Action by Sector. And you will find uh, figures uh, um, on fashion. We, uh, Very Good Fashion, are working with Climate Change to try to get consistent and robust figures. Indeed, as we all know, it is urgent to act, but we must act where the impact numbers are the highest and without reliable data, we risk not being effective. One of the actions that could be carried out by the United Nations and its organization is the work on the data that make it safe, robust, and without bias. Another point on which uh, objective information is absolutely necessary is the impact of the different material you used. To make intelligent, useful decisions, it is essential that the impact database used in the life cycle analysis are without bias in favor of this or this place of production or this or this material without objective arguments by birth protectionism. To put in the dock from one day to the next a natural raw material that some fashion brands are going to stop using, it's also depriving small farmers often located in developing countries of income. Here also the United Nations and its organization, bearer of the general interest of humanity, creator of the sustainable development goals, which are imposed to all of us, they have an imminent role to play by being the judge of peace on the data used in the life cycle analysis, so that they are objective and that social issues are not forgotten where decisions are made. The last point I wanted to develop with you is the issue of the customer. We will have to do our best together to reduce the impact of raw materials, manufacturing, transportation in the fashion world. But if the people who buy and wear the clothes do not play the, their part, we will not make progress. At Very Good Fashion, we did a citizen consultation on the perception of sustainable fashion. We had more than 100,000 uh, participants, 3,000 proposals, and half a million votes. The first topic that was uh, cited was recycling and secondhand. And these of, of course, essential subjects, but totally linked to the consumer behavior. If the second uh, hand generates more purchase of clothes under the pretext that it will be resold, the impact will continue to increase. If there is no efficient recycling network in the city's origin of the country, at, and the clothes at the end of their life are food in open air waste dumps, the impact will continue to increase. I see two issues where the United Nations and its organization have a role to play. It is by informing and training citizens to enable them to fully act as responsible citizens and to help region cities that do not yet have effective uh, channel for recycling, for textile recycling, to put them in place and to create jobs in the sector of repair and transformation of clothing. Once again, thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of Good Fashion. And um, the floor is back to you, Leila. Thank you so much, Sylvie. And uh, I loved your remarks about the data. I think that's spot on. <laughs> so I will next introduce um, Simone Cipriani once again. One um, I apologize, Leila. Um, yeah, no worries. If you can give Hussein a few minutes, he is finally, uh, he is here. Thank you. Ah, brilliant. Um, welcome, <laughs> Hussein. Would you uh, like to make your remarks? Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Leila. I'm sorry, I was uh, having some technical issues to get into the call um, and that delayed the opening. I just wanted to step in uh, without breaking the chain of the discussion, but just uh, apologizing, first of all, uh, on behalf of Lizia Norona, the Secretary of the Environment Management Group, for not being able to come to this very important discussion. And uh, she wanted me to come in and convey uh, these words of apologies, first and foremost. 
Um, I just I, I also listened very uh, interestingly to the points that have so far been uh, mentioned about this topic. Um, I just wanted to uh, maybe bring some um, uh, perspectives and maybe some expectations that uh, would help the discussion to be useful for uh, all types of people with the, all kinds of expertise around the table to be able to follow it and to be able also to contribute to it, but also for us to take something from it in, in contributing to the future events and uh, meetings and reports um, and maybe initiatives under the Environment Management Group on this um, topic, obviously with the focus on the environment dimensions. I think there is a couple of points that I wanted to, to bring up here within my very limited knowledge of the sustainable fashion, but I thought maybe these are the um, issues that might be also the concerns of the range of other people that are uh, involved in the sustainable development area, but not necessarily specializing in sustainable fashion. One thing is the definition. Uh, we really need to create awareness and maybe in, in enhance awareness about what do we mean by sustainable fashion. The second issue is the role and contribution of sustainable, uh, and the, uh, the role and the contribution and the impact of uh, sustainable fashion uh, and actually the fashion industry on the environment, um, on the SDGs, um, on the COVID recovery uh, plans, uh, and specifically uh, on the specific issues of the environmental agenda, biodiversity, pollution, free planet, production consumption, and, 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 and most of all, on the behavioral change um, uh, of the consumers and the produ producers. Um, we would like very much to hear from the presenters uh, con issues concerning uh, sustainability in reporting and certification and traceability, which obviously has been um, you know, in the words that I have also heard in, in, in this call and also in the past uh, meetings. It will be very interesting to, to see to what extent this industry has progress in terms of uh, reporting and certification and how much uh, in that area we need to um, uh, sort of uh, make progress, both in terms of not harming the environment, but also doing good to the environment, if, if you could do so in, in our presentations. Um, there is, uh, of course, a lot of elements here in terms of addressing the, the you know, the, the value change and how uh, that actually can uh, take into account most and uh, more and more the environmental elements and provisions. In your deliberations on the micro and mi the micro and the macro analysis of, of the fashion industry, it would be really interesting to not to really look in too much of the backward uh, related issues, but also forward related issues and how can this um, COVID uh, recovery opportunity actually create opportunity for a, a, a shift uh, and a transformation towards sustainable uh, fashion. Um, there are a lot of elements in the concept note that uh, helps us to understand where do we come from here and what are the possible outcomes of this call that could guide, as I said in the earlier points, the future reflections of the Environment Management Group on this very important topic with this specific focus, as I said, on the environmental dimensions. I would like to stop here. I just wanted to give these messages or sort of share these messages or, 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 or questions from a non-specialist uh, per, uh, perspective in order so that I can, at the end of this call, gather for uh, ourselves how much from the environment management uh, environmental management uh, perspective contribute to the future of this topic. Over to you and happy also to be with you throughout and learn from you and also contribute in the end, maybe in the closing of, of this conversation. Over to you and thank you very much for this opportunity. Fantastic. Some really, really good thinking points. I will also consider those for the final panel. That was very helpful. Um, so we'll now pivot to Simone Cipriani for the presentation of the key initiatives mapping. Thanks, Simone. Oh, I think you're on mute, Simone. 
<laughs> sorry, 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 my fault. Very easy to I, do. Said, <laughs> I said, I said, I'll stick to the points of Hussein to be a good presenter and to be a good person in in this in this endeavor. Uh, what we do as EFI, as EFI Ethical Fashion Initiative, we started this years ago uh, to create sustainable fashion, which is to say to create value for society and for the environment at, at the same time, to create a business model that generates social and environmental value along with economic value. And we do this by managing a value chain that we have created in which you have many things. You have an accelerator for emerging brands in Africa, you have an investment facility, but you also have a huge supply chain, a huge supply chain that we manage with artisans from marginalized conditions all over Africa and in Afghanistan. And I say hello to Sakina from Afghanistan. I've seen her in the chat. Asr Bada Zohor Sakina, we are glad to see you here. Uh, so we, we manage this in such a way that we are suppliers of I would say all the main fashion brands and distributors all over the world. We have been with them or we are with them now, with them now. As we do this, we've always faced the problem on how to report the sustainability of our work. And this is why we started working with some of the major uh, fashion groups worldwide and with the association of the Italian fashion brands to uh, define uh, uh, two new ESG due diligence and reporting tools. One of these tools is just to assess the ESG risk of every supplier. So it's a supply chain tool. The other one is a more general tool on ESG due diligence and corporate sustainability reporting. Just to give you an idea, I cannot go into the detail, but it's a tool which is based on 20 areas of due diligence on 20 accounting and reporting tools and on 283 quantitative indicators. It's a monster, it's huge. We are the testing this with selected fashion brands uh, all over the world to refine it and to present it to, to the world, I hope, I hope very soon. Uh, this allows me to say that the ESG dimension and the reporting of the ESG dimension is key. Hussein is right. Today, rating agencies are preparing and organizing themselves to rate companies on the basis of financial reports, but also on the basis of sustainability. Uh, rating companies such as Standard & Poor's and Moody's are acquiring sustainability rating companies to acquire this kind of competence. And we are working with some of them to make this reporting system consistent with their needs. At the same time, this kind of reporting is also requested by uh, governments and, and, uh, and international organizations. In Europe, there is the European Union that is working on a new directive on corporate sustainability reporting. And we are part of this work to be sure we are, we are also aligned with that. Now, reporting is key. Uh, transparency is key. But the real thing, the fundamental thing is what comes before, which is to say, what I do of positive in the use of environmental and social capital, and then I report about that. And as we manage a supply chain, we conjugate these, part, these two things, the reporting, the transparency, but also the doing. What we generate in terms of positive social and environmental value. And to do that, we started in our uh, supply chain to apply all what we preach. Uh, first of all, we have a uh, long time ago opted for uh, biomaterials and for uh, natural processes and so on. In some of our productions, the textiles, for instance, from Burkina Faso, 98% uh, of inputs are organic cotton. And then we use 
uh, natural dyes. And when we cannot use natural dyes, we use God certified colorants. So uh, God certifies dyes. So certified dyes. So I don't go. I, I, will, I won't go into technicalities, but this is just to explain this. Then the decarbonization, which is not about offsetting, it's about insetting. And it's not only about uh, uh, the sources of energy, renewable energies, which in the places where we work, in some of the places where we work, they are better and more affordable than, than fossil fuel. Uh, so that is fine, but also the kind of materials you use. Because the carbon footprint starts from materials, starts from agriculture, starts from uh, all the processes in the upstream domain, and then circularity. And then circularity, we are creating the first completely circular factory with a group of investors from the UK and from South Africa in Kenya, in one of our production uh, outposts. And, and, and circularity is very complex because circularity is the circularity of inputs, so using water properly, treating water, treating all the effluents in order to reuse water, treating all the inputs to reuse them, but also using as raw materials things that already exist and that are repurposed through our work. Just to give you an idea, in Eastern Africa, uh, where we work, we receive in between Kenya and Tanzania 8,040 feet containers per year of secondhand clothes. These secondhand clothes, which in Swahili we call mitumba, uh, were, have destroyed the local industry 20 years ago. But today, they become a resource to create new jobs, more jobs on this circularity approach. So in a nutshell, this is what we are doing at the Ethical Fashion Initiative. We are uh, we have created the global movement on ESG reporting and due diligence, and we are creating new tools for this with the, with the, with the fashion industry. And at the same time, we are putting into practice some of the environmental practices we preach to generate environmental value. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Simone. Lots of ground covered in a very brief amount of time. Well done. Um, perfect. So we'll hand over now to welcome uh, Ms. Paula Deda, who's the Director of Forest, Land and Housing Division of UNECE. Welcome, Paula. Thank you. Thank you very much. And well, I'm very excited already in this discussion, having Simone introducing a very important point before me. And actually also thank you, Osain, who's an old colleague and friend, uh, is saying uh, um, he's not an expert in sustainable fashion. I would say that beside and, and apart from, from Simone, none of the others uh, in the UN system were really sustainable fashion experts. We all became by looking at the sustainable fashion angle that pertains to our uh, organization. Now, um, yes, reporting, sure, we have to be very careful, though, that we uh, don't support greenwashing through reporting, because reporting doesn't make something sustainable, not. I completely agree with Simone, which is what we do and the choices we make uh, that are sustainable or not. And one very important, a key point is materials, and that's where I come in um, uh, to talk about materials used in fashion. Let me be very honest and, and straightforward. Less than one problem in sustainable fashion. Polyester is unsustainable, no matter how. No matter whether you, you trace it, you report about it, you, you call it sustainable, it's not. So um, I think that we're all aware of the discussions that took place this week in Geneva on, um, on the Convention on Plastics. Uh, polyester is plastic. So absolutely unsustainable. Now, if you can go to the next slide, um, then where, where are the solutions? Are there solutions? Yes, um, there are important new raw materials, man-made man cellulosics, which are um, forest fibers made from dissolved wood pulp. Um, they are like viscose, lyocell, acetate, modal are just examples of that. They have the potential of being more sustainable since they are, of course, renewable. And here, please look at the figures. Um, it's really definitely and safe to say that lyocell is considered the best in its class, as it's made talking of circularity in a closed loop that recycles the majority of the solvents used so that no chemical enters the waste stream. Now, um, 
uh, when we look at uh, what we call MMCFs, man-made cellular fibers, uh, through our work um, in, in, in our forest uh, division, we do it through projections of forest products as well as annual market reviews. And what we can see here, well, first of all, you see it on the left, that unfortunately polyester or, or let's say oil-based materials are still a big share of the market with 63%. Cotton is only currently at 24, and man made cellulosic fibers occupy only 6.7%. However, however, there is hope. There is a um, uh, there is hope for a change. It is forecasted by 2025 annual production of uh, MMCFs will be at 4.7%, while synthetic fibers will go down to 3.7%. Seven percent, and cotton is also uh, slowly reducing its expected uh, uh, production uh, below one percent by 2025. Let's not forget, and you have a table there that you see clearly also the impact that cotton and uh, polyester have on use of land, viscose. Uh, I mean, sorry, use of land and use of water, and of course the the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, next uh, slide. What we have been doing so far, well, we have started a campaign that many of you know and have participated in. There is no need to talk, uh, give you the details of Forest for Fashion Initiative. We have several partners in this from forest certification bodies. Let's not forget there is that traceability is already happening for forest products, including uh, forest fibers. So it's also on the, from that perspective, we are very much advanced. We also have a movie that is called Made in Forest with Michelle Yeoh, the actress, and UNDP Goodwill ambassador is looking at forest fibers and, in general, the impact of materials on uh, um, on, uh, on fashion and uh, the, the impact on the environment. And again, the importance of making sure that the first choice is the right choice. So choosing the right material makes a difference. You can move to the next one. Um, well, uh, this is an important graph I just wanted to briefly share because when we, um, uh, of course, talk about forest fibers, uh, we are often get asked about how to guarantee that the supply of wood-based fibers to the fashion industry is sustainable. And the answer is through sust uh, sustainable forest management. Obviously, it's logic that if local communities can live from the products they receive from forests, they are less likely to transform them into one more profitable type of land use uh, that most probably is also less sustainable. Uh, this is a graph taken from a recent study, State of the World's Forest Report, which uh, uh, shows um, the rate of net forest loss decreased substantially over the period 1990 2020, also due to a reduction in deforestation in some countries, plus increases in forest areas in others. And obviously, if we need to produce more forest fibers, this will also mean that we will need more forests around the world. And then we come to my conclusion. And again, a few words about uh, our partners, but mainly our work through the Alliance with many of you, we have worked at different initiatives. Uh, we have recently, for instance, a policy dialogue on Moldova with ITC and other members of uh, the Alliance, uh, together with stakeholders of the Moldovan fashion industry to discuss really the potential of, of this industry and recommendations for a shift. So member states are asking indeed also uh, for advice on how to make this uh, change. Uh, currently, we are working with uh, a Wood Rise conference in Lausanne to discuss how to um, introduce more forest fiber in, fibers in the sports industry. You can imagine that the sports industry uses a lot of uh, polyester and oil-based fibers. So how do we make this shift uh, with the specific sector? And we're also working in-house with our colleagues at the Road Safety Fund on advocating uh, and a campaign that involves uh, forest, uh, forest-based fibers as well as road safety messages. We are trying to put the two things together. And last but not least, of course, International Day of Forest next year will be dedicated to consumption and production patterns. And uh, of course, uh, we will, will be another opportunity to talk about making the right choice with the right material. Uh, 
uh, in general, we are ready to work with the, with the Alliance in particular for this proposal of a due diligence system and as well as of any other cooperative and collaborative uh, activity. We have been really happy with this work since its beginning. So uh, thank you so much and I hope I didn't uh, take too much time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paola. Um, we're now going to head towards our next session. So this is Bettina Heller, Ms. Bettina Heller, from the, who's a program officer from UNEP. Welcome, Bettina. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to share my screen. Can you see? Perfect, because I have some um, a fancy PowerPoint. <laughs> So I need to click through. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. Uh, lovely to, to speak um, all of all of you today. Uh, nice to connect and um, really interesting the discussion so far. So from the UNEP side, we are really looking at sustainability and circularity in the textile value chain. Um, so I'm going to present a bit about our activities there uh, just before I dive in to acknowledge that um, I am based in our Paris office, but we have a lot of other offices across UNEP working um, on this issue, also on um, sort of different focus areas around um, fashion and textiles and sustainability. Um, and before I also go into the details of the textile value chain, um, I just wanted to talk a bit about UNEP's value chain approach, because this is an approach that we're um, applying to various sectors, amongst them also the textile sector. And basically the approach that we're taking is to first of all, define the value chain and really look at um, where are the impacts that arise along the different stages of the value chain to identify so-called hotspots. So the most important impact areas, those could be environmental, but also social and economic hotspots so that we know how, where we can focus our efforts because there's so much to do, right? So we need to start somewhere and this helps us to prioritize. And the second step is to consolidate basically what's already happening, see where there are gaps and where there are opportunities um, for action. And the third step is to then define a common agenda with stakeholders around the world and help to prioritize action and take those forward. So um, the first two steps we um, did through a report that we published um, last year um, that basically summarized um, what I just um, talked about. And I'll share a bit more from this report before I go into our other initiatives. Um, so just because I talk about value chain and um, it's not always obvious what a value chain is and how it's different to a supply chain or a life cycle. So basically the value chain comprises all of the steps. Um, so usually we have um, that linear system that is still mostly in place. So you can see it goes from fiber production through to end of life. Um, but it also comprises the actors and stakeholders that either create value along that chain or are deprived of value. Um, so this means we really have to also think about the people. And the value chain also helps us to go maybe one step beyond. Um, so also looking at what are the, the lifestyles that shape the system? How do consumers define their aspirations? Um, what are the business models um, that actually shape the system? Because when we look at um, addressing impacts, of course, we we can look at sort of different steps. We can look at the materials, we can look at the consumption patterns, but in the end, maybe um, what will help us the most is looking at these sort of systemic actions. So for instance, how are products designed? How are they put on the market? Um, how long will they be used? And what happens to them after use? That really helps us um, to, to tackle the issues. And the little round graphic you can see here on slide is basically um, our dream to go towards a more circular system. So. That means closing the loop, of course. Um, but for us, what's important is that the overarching principle should be reduced by design. So first of all, it's about how do we make sure that we move uh, maybe more towards slow fashion, so to say. Um, of course, that also varies per world region. So we know there are regions that are over-consuming and there are regions that do not yet um, meet their basic consumption. So this, of course, has to be taken into account. And then there are other um, options such as and refuse and reduce at the, the point of the consumer, reusing and repairing and repurposing. And um, so there are quite a lot of options we can take to move towards a more circular system and they all play together. Um, in terms of um, the environmental hotspots that we have identified um, in our first report, I won't go into the socioeconomic ones because I think ILO would have that very well covered. Um, but you can see um, it basically helps to see what happens at which stage of the value chain. So, Again, it's sort of, there's probably not one, the 
good dream material um, everything has sort of its good points and bad points so for instance here we can see cotton cultivation has high chemical use and high water use but then when it comes to synthetic fibers of course they're made from fossil fuels so that has a high climate impact then we look at um, washing and drying so for instance how do consumers wash their clothes um, we know that in japan from the culture it's mostly cold wash so there the impacts will be much lower than say in france where we still wash quite a lot at 60 degree level um, and so on. And again, um, there have to be actions that actually address those um, stages, but also um, the most effective ones will be the ones that are cross-cutting. So that really looks at the consumption patterns, the business models, how the whole system is shaped. Um, what we've heard from consultations that we've led um, throughout the years um, is basically that there are three key needs that need addressing. So the first one is more support from governments. So basically policies that um, set the level playing field and that really incentivize also longer use of products and one more circular and sustainable system. Also, of course, taking into account that it needs to be a just transition. There needs to be more on collaboration finance. Um, so in terms of if we think especially about smaller players, SMEs in developing countries, they really need support, uh, capacity building and technical assistance. But also in general, there needs to be more financing for new innovative um, ways of uh, basically um, of the textile system. And a third very important one are changes in consumption habits. So of course we can offer a lot of um, uh, secondhand products, repair options, products that last longer, but if we as consumers then do not embrace those options, of course they, they won't really come to scale. And cross-cutting I think also came out already from other speakers today is the need for accountability. So basically through due diligence or through transparency and traceability um, efforts and, and so on. Now, um, what's upcoming from our side is we're currently working on a roadmap to sustainability and circularity in the textile value chain. Um, so we held a couple of consultation workshops and we're now drafting that. And the idea is to really provide um, actions that each stakeholder can take, also making the point that each stakeholder, so be it a, a policymaker, a producer and manufacturer, a, a consumer or a recycling um, expert can really play a role. Um, and we're trying to prioritize those and put them into a comprehensive roadmap. And we are also working on a sustainable fashion communication strategy. So again, speaking to the point that we do need um, more consumer engagement around that, more awareness. So this really looks at the role of consumer facing storytelling and shifting the narrative. I think also something that Sophia already raised in the beginning in the keynote. Um, and then I just wanted to mention that we're also sort of working on the ground because um, of course we need the sort of global work to have the science, to map the impacts and to decide where we wanna go next. But we also need to help those that um, are basically, that maybe do not have the capacity yet to be part of this transition. So um, we have a project that works at global level at data analysis and at, um, at looking at the trade-offs basically that circularity would bring about, but also that works in three countries in Africa, which is Tunisia, Kenya, and South Africa. And here we will really work with SMEs to help them to adopt more sustainable business models in the textile industry and, um, and really have a very strong active role in that transition. And yeah, I think that's it. I hope I stayed in time. I didn't see the time. Um, but yeah, also we have a regular newsletter and a website. So do check that out and sign up and send us your news. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bettina. We're slightly inching towards over time, but no, I think that was great. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, okay, and then I think uh, we will now hand over to uh, Margarita Licata, who is a technical specialist for the ILO. Welcome, Margarita. I think you're muted, Margarita. Sorry, I made a Simone's mistake. I was too enthusiastic about the presentation. So I wanted just to say good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I work at the sectoral policy department of the ILO and I coordinate work around the retail and commerce, but naturally I'm here to represent the work done by Many of my colleagues in Asia, uh, where we have uh, many of the programs uh, related to the 
textile and garment sector and naturally at the at borders. Um, this presentation, you can go already on the next slide. This presentation will focus really on those programs that try to combine uh, environmental and social uh, sustainability. So I'm not going to talk about many other programs that we have, a better work program is one of our flagship program. But here I'm focusing on uh, is new program, a program that, that deals with the garment supply chain and this work in Asia region, focusing on four countries, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Two main areas of work. Uh, one is really try to build up a bit the knowledge and an understanding of what are the practices and tools around a number of areas, uh, but looking at also at the intersection between these areas. So, for example, social dialogue and industrial relation, what are the implications uh, in the context of a shift to environmental sustainability? Uh, what are the implications of gender equality? Uh, and, and also, what does it mean enhancing productivity in the context of environmental sustainability. And then the second area is really looking at uh, how we can coordinate and help the stakeholders to coordinate better, to be ready for the shift and understanding the need for both social and environmental sustainability. Uh, next slide. Yes, now as a result of this uh, program, uh, a just transition toolkit has been uh, developed. It is uh, very much uh, made of uh, uh, some of the research, uh, new research that has been published, I think, between 2020 and 2021. Uh, just to give you some highlight, uh, uh, the, the research, uh, I hope you can see it here, but one is about reducing the footprint and uh, how to assess the carbon emission in the garment sector in Asia and looks at really uh, into where and why carbon intensity of textile and garment varies across the supply chain and where activities need to be put in place to decarbonize the different segment of the supply chain. Uh, then there is another research about green and cloves. So Someone mentioned certification. Uh, this specific research look at the a, a initiative uh, in terms of capacity building, certification, uh, advocacy initiative, but also tools development, and try to analyze also where the gaps are. In particular, this research also look at the gaps, especially among small and medium enterprises. Bettina mentioned the focus on small and medium enterprises. Uh, what are the gaps when we talk about, for example, awareness around environmental issues, awareness around their responsibility in environmental legislation, and also issues about around lack of access to knowledge and skill transfer network that allow them to make that shift uh, to environmental sustainability. Uh, then there is the, another research, uh, without uh, going too much into details, uh, that look at the environmental impact assessment that have been uh, developed in the four uh, countries. Uh, next slide. Uh, now at global level, and this is an initiative that is still at the conceptual stage, uh, ILO and I would say sector is moving towards a more comprehensive approach to ensure just transition in the fashion industry two main areas we are looking at. First of all, the employment effect of climate change and the, the shift to circularity, and what are the policy, the action that we need to put in place to avoid unwanted effect on workers and enterprises. Um, five main areas I want to focus uh, on in this discussion. First of all, uh, adapting social protection systems to the workers affected. Uh, COVID has been really as represented in an unparalleled uh, uh, example of how social protection could be used to create coping mechanisms. Uh, rethink skills policy, what are the needs in terms of the skills, in terms of upskilling, reskilling, what are the needs of workers in this labor intensive sector when we move towards environmental sustainability? Strengthening monitoring, strengthening due diligence uh, exercise also in the circular fashion model. Um, strategy to ensure formalization uh, of those business models that are yet uh, not uh, represented by decent work. For example, if you look at the second end market, if you look at the waste collection and the repair market, they're still characterized by a high degree of informality. So how do we ensure that we transition to formalization? 
and then naturally uh, creating an enabling environment for enterprises and again for small and medium enterprises to provide incentive to those enterprises to move to sustainable alternative, but also to make sure those alternatives are viable. And the last but not least, this is a two partnership that we are pursuing. This is the next slide. Thank you. Uh, one, ILO is very active with the UN Partnership for Action on Green Economy and have been uh, also working on assessing the effect of green economy on the labor market. And then uh, the, the partnership with the platform for accelerating the circular economy. Pace, uh, we contributed to the action agenda on advancing circular economy in textile, particularly a call to action nine that look at really the issues of decent work in the transition to circular economy. And we are going actually to have uh, a webinar the 14th September in Pace in the context of the World the Circular Economy Forum. Um, maybe I want to stop here. This is just a highlights of uh, much of the work going on. And uh, I give the floor back to Leila. Thank you so much, Margarita. Very, very rich, interesting content that we can draw on, hopefully, in our panel discussion shortly. Um, perfect. Okay, so now I will hand over to uh, Ms. Marissa Henderson, who's the Head of Programme for Creative Economy at UNCTAD. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Carolina Quintana. Unfortunately, Marisa, who is the Chief of the Programme, could not uh, be here today. So she asked me to step in and talk about our work on the creative economy in UNCTAD. So I'm very pleased to be here and um, be able to contribute uh, to this conversation about our work and its relationship with the sustainable development. Um, the creative economy has been thriving according to UNCTAD. Um, between 2002 and 2015, the global market for creative goods, which comprises uh, design, including fashion, jewelry, and film, more than double in size, from 208 billion to 509 billion. And uh, recent research shows that uh, in 2017, uh, creative goods accounted for 4% of the world's merchandise trade. It's a very dynamic sector. Uh, the creative economy contributes uh, to sustainable development by promoting the generation of jobs, innovation and trade, while contributing to social inclusion and cultural diversity. Uh, recognition of the importance of the creative economy to country socioeconomic development has only accelerated in recent years alongside demand for greater insight into the creative economy. In December 2019, the United Nations General Assembly recognized the role of the creative economy in supporting entrepreneurship, stimulating innovation and economic development, empowering people, including the young people, with the adoption of a resolution on creative economy. And this resolution highlights the creative economy as an important tool for the attainment of the sustainable development goals for development in an inclusive and equitable manner. As the sharing economy, social entrepreneurship, and the spread of ideas grow apace, UNCTAD's technical cooperation work and analysis on creative economy shows that the sector has the power to inspire present and future generations to protect our planet, people, cultures, and natural resources, and therefore contribute to a more sustainable development path. So we could think about architects that uh, create green spaces in local communities that facilitate connections and social interaction. We can think about the designers who integrate the circular uh, economy principles in the conceptualization of products, be it in fashion, or it could be art crafts, or it could be visual arts. So these uh, sectors have a great potential to contribute uh, to the SDGs. And these leads us neatly to the conception of the circular economy in relation to creative industries. And this nexus encourages us to draw connections between creativity, production, distribution, exhibition, and archiving and back to new creations. 
in addressing more sustainable consumption and production patterns, circular economy principles complement creative industries. Moving towards a circular economy implies the detachment of resource exhaustion from economic growth by designing out waste and pollution and keeping products and materials in use and regenerating natural systems. So this nexus goes beyond simply recycling and managing waste. Rather, it means designing products, processes, and services to optimize the use of resources so that when something reaches the end of its useful life, we reuse, repair, or remanufacture it for another use. So we need a mind shift. Now, these materials um, are uh, it presents the opportunity to fundamentally address how we create value in our economies and minimize its impacts. Um, I, I am not going to extend further on, on more details. I will just jump into um, what, what uh, we consider that needs to be highlighted. And one of the key aspects is the, the impact of the pandemic, which greatly affected the cultural and the creative industries. Uh, the worst hit uh, initially, of course, uh, was felt in the entertainment activities and the live presentations um, due to the lockdown measures, as you all have uh, experienced. But thanks to uh, the, um, as we say, the necessity is the mother of innovation. So people were able to come up uh, with new solutions and reinvent a new way of being together apart, as we say. So we were able to benefit from um, a lot of these creative industries thanks to digitalization. So we think digitalization, it's, it's a very powerful tool uh, for the development of uh, these uh, creative industries. Um, as we also see, um, the, this uh, pandemia created a slowdown of the economy worldwide and put a lot of pressure on consumer spending and disposable income. Uh, so, of course, uh, customers may need to change uh, in terms of individuals' propensity to consume cultural and creative products and services. Uh, they were very much affected. For us, this sector is very important because um, it's a job intensive sector. It employs 29.5 uh, million people. Uh, in the cultural and creative industries, it represents 1% of the world's active population. So the creative economy uh, has the, the supports a, a balanced urban and regional development, as well as countries' international attractiveness as touristic um, uh, destinations. And we uh, promote more public investment and also private investment in the cultural and creative industries. Um, particular relevant to fight unemployment uh, worldwide. We organize uh, several events uh, in the year uh, to promote during the year of uh, International Year of Creative Economy. UNTAD is a leading agency in the implementation of this resolution together with UNESCO and other UN agencies. And uh, our focus uh, of work is on developing globally applicable principles to engage policymakers as well as creative entrepreneurs and other relevant stakeholders and to provide global shared practices, policy frameworks and skills training for the creative industries. And this is done through a number of national case studies that we have done and training such as in Algeria, Zimbabwe, Ukraine and Angola and also through social and digital media training intended to boost economic development. Since uh, the creation of our program in 2004, UNCTAD has played a leading role in supporting developing countries to enhance the understanding of the economic contribution of the creative industries from a trade and development perspective through capacity building, analysis and consensus building. And the program's core focus is on trade, trade of creative goods and services and the role of the creative economy in the growth of developing countries. 
Und das I have to wrap up soon, Caroline. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, sincere apologies. We're a little bit behind time, so I'm having to be stricter with people now. Thank yes, you very yes. much. Thank you. Thank I you. really appreciate your comments. Okay, we will now hand over to... Um, we are going next to Elizabeth Turk, who's the Director of Economic Cooperation and Trade Division in UNECE. Welcome, Elizabeth. Many thanks, Lila. And um, I think we have sent you a presentation if Nina can display it. But the most important is that you can properly hear me. So big thank you to the EMG for leading that Nexus dialogue. I'm definitely not an expert on, on fashion, but it's been super enriching and informative for me to listen through all these presentations. And uh, it's been nice to see how important the concepts of value chain and circularity are, because I've heard them frequently. And that's also the entry point we are taking at UNECE's Economic Cooperation and, and Trade Division. So what I would like to do in the five minutes here now is to share with you a little bit, uh, some information about the project we are implementing jointly with ITC, that's Joe Wozniak and his team, and that's financially supported by the EU. So big thank you to our partners and, and also to our donors. Now, um, what, uh, what does the project do? The project focuses on traceability and transparency of value chains in garments and footwear sector. So that's again, it's really a mouthful. It's maybe not good for marketing, but we've very carefully chosen these words and I'd like to go through some of the drivers and trends why we've chosen that entry point. And I think much of that links up to what we've heard before from some of the other presentations. So first of all, they are the consumers. The consumers are increasingly demanding sustainable products and they want to know where, by whom, and how their clothes are being made. And Nina, perfect, you can stay on that slide a little bit and then I'll, I'll tell you when to move. So first uh, driver is the consumer. Uh, second driver is civil society, regulators, and also investors, I heard that coming up, and uh, those stakeholders, they are increasingly giving attention to the credibility of the many sustainability claims. So the investors need to be able to trust the information that is given by the producers, and there is really increasing attention on that. The third driver, and again, it's been coming up in the discussion here, the third driver is really the value chains. And a product is only sustainable if the production process is sustainable or circular at each step of the value chain. And when we look at textiles and footwear, we look really at the sector where the value chains are particularly complex, particularly opaque, and also very fragmented. Yeah, we have lots of silos that are not being connected and the information is not flowing between these different steps of the value chain. So that's why here in UNECE and together with ITC, we chose to work on traceability, transparency about the environmental and social performance of textiles throughout the whole value chain. So uh, when designing the project, we also realized that we need to look at different entry points at, at different levels. And there is, first of all, the policy level. We are really advocating for policy coherence and, and the right type of incentives. Secondly, there is the standards level. So here we need minimum criteria, we need KPIs, and we need particularly a common language that allows the different actors along the value chain to, to connect and to engage. And thirdly, we are looking at the technology entry point because it's clear that digital transformation, advanced technologies, blockchain, they can all be a really important enabler for sustainability. Now, at the same time, we realize that it's really an enormous task, and uh, that's why we are giving a focus to capacity building. Capacity building is needed for SMEs, particularly in developing countries, but also in countries with economies in transition. That's a very important constituency for UNECE, and of course, also in developed economies. Secondly, we are looking at awareness raising and, and education for the consumers. They play a crucial role. And thirdly, it's, it's clear that multi-stakeholder collaboration is, is crucial to the success. So what exactly do we do? And here is where the current slide comes in. We have two components to this product. Uh, one is with UNECE and one is with ITC. And the UNECE component has produced a toolbox. And that toolbox contains a policy recommendation, implementation guidelines, a global information exchange standard. And here it's very important for me to mention that these results, these tools, 
they have gone through the UNECE normative machinery. So basically they have gone through our intergovernmental decision-making process. We have a mandate and our member states have really looked at these tools and, and adopted them. And I think that, that adds great value to the type of recommendations and tools we are producing. Secondly, we are currently doing a blockchain pilot. That's maybe something to go into a little bit more detail afterwards. And thirdly, we have just recently launched a call to action because it's clear that if we have these tools, it's no value if they sit on the shelf. We have to get them used. And that's where we are resorting to our call to action and proud that by now we have a large number of organizations, companies, and initiatives that already have made their, their pledges under this call to action. Second part of the project is, is with ITC. And Nina, if you move us to the next slide. Um, ITC is really also uh, joining hands here with us in, in, in their core competence areas. And there, there are two elements to that which I would like to flag. And there is first the sustainability map. And I think that, that's a great tool. I would almost kind of call it a, a public good because we know that there are so many different sustainability standards around. And ITC has developed a neutral platform that allows for the benchmarking, for the streamlining, and uh, for of these sustainability standards. And I think in so doing it really will allow us to, to bring uh, some, some important cost savings. ITC has developed and implemented that through IT solutions for the convergence of social and labor audits in the garment facilities. And that is really based on, on a wide, wide database of standards. The second way how ITC is coming into the project is to support the upstream actors in the emerging economies. And, and what does this mean? This means basically that we are talking about assisting SMEs in developing countries and in countries with economies in, decision, in, uh, in transition. And these SMEs who are producing the inputs into the textiles value chain, be it cotton, yarn, cloth, and so forth. So here, ITC assists them with obtaining market access. And very important here, because many of the SMEs, they don't really have the technical or the financial resources to get this going. And I, I think that's really key to the success. And um, from the project here, we can see that ITC is collaborating also in the context of the social labor convergence platform uh, together with ILO. And I'm happy to see the, the ILO colleagues before. So I hope that with this, I, I've made you curious. And uh, Nina, if you move us to the last slide, so what, what can you all do is you can join the sustainability pledge. Uh, it's just been opened uh, before the summer and um, the sustainability pledge will really help us to, to focus our, our actions on outreach, capacity building and implementation. And I very much look forward to joining hands with, with all of us. And I think from uh, Economic Cooperation and Trade Division, we bring sort of the, the value chain perspective to all of this. And I am very keen on having a series of bilateral follow-up discussions because I do see important uh, interactions and, and synergies with some of the other work streams that were presented. So many thanks, Leda, back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Lots to take in. Um, I will now pivot to uh, Nicholas Spenningson, who's the manager of the Global Climate Action Programme in the UNFCCC. Nicholas, welcome. Thank you so much, <coughs> Laila, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's, it's really nice to have this opportunity to be part of this, this discussion. So my name is Nicholas Svenningsen. I'm working with UNFCCC, so that is in short, UN Climate Change. Um, we're mostly known for trying to get uh, 197 governments of the world to work together about climate change, how to tackle the climate crisis that we are facing. Um, we are also quite well known for our COPs, our Conference of the Parties that we normally have annually. We didn't have one last year because of the pandemic, but we are, uh, we believe that we will have the next COP in Glasgow in two months from now, uh, hoping that everything goes together and goes well with, with the pandemic and so on. What people don't know about us is that we're also working quite a lot with what we call non-party stakeholders with the private sector. Uh, and the reason we're doing this is simply that the climate crisis is too big for governments to handle on their own. We need all hands on deck. And I'm not going to show a lot of slides today here, but I, this is one slide that I think kind of says it all. It's a slide that illustrates the average temperature globally from 1850 to the left to 2020 to the right. Now, um, blue is colder, red is warmer. 
So you can see what is actually happening here. And this is certainly not based only on a few scientists and a few studies. It's based on basically what all the scientists and all the studies are telling us. This is happening and we are the cause. We are causing this by burning fossil fuels, how we are using land, the way we live, transport, um, how we dress, how we eat without consideration for our planet. So when we talk about fashion from the UN climate change perspective, we really focus specifically on this picture, on the climate change picture. And we are really grateful for all the other work that is happening in the UN system to be part of that, as well as all the work that is happening outside the UN system, because it needs to be connected, it needs to work together. Um, if I could have the, the next slide, please. So basically what we did three years ago, when we we're looking at a couple of different sectors and the fashion sector was one of the sectors that really caught our eye, uh, we decided that maybe we can connect the dots. Maybe we can facilitate more focus on climate specifically. There's a lot of things happening on sustainability and environmental protection and labor rights and all that, as we have heard here today, but on climate specifically. Um, the fashion sector is, of course, one of the largest sectors in the world from an economic perspective on employment, on um, lifestyles, climate impact, and so on. It crosses borders, it crosses generation, and uh, it involves thousands and thousands of stakeholders along the whole value chain. Um, so that is why we started this UNFCCC Fashion Industry Char Charter for Climate Action. So what we're doing there, we have today about 200 signatories from uh, brands, from producers, from logistics, from financing institutions and other. And it's really collaboration, business to business. We are providing the platform. We're trying to facilitate this work, but it is really the fashion sector itself that is doing the work. So we are looking in different working groups and different work streams. We're looking on decarbonization pathways, the raw materials, the manufacturing side, the logistics, the policy engagement, what is happening in the brand stores, and of course also what is happening on the consumer side and how we can um, encourage and support consumers to become more sustainable also in their fashion choices. Now, this is something that um, we are doing with an eye to achieve the Paris objective, the Paris Agreement objective, which is basically a climate neutral world by 2050. What this means in practice is that we need to reduce our global emissions and thereby also from the sector by 50% in the next eight years until 2030. And then we need to get rid of the rest by 2050. So this is a very, very um, large, uh, large ambition and something that we cannot achieve on our own, but we need to work together with, with everybody. Um, the role of policy making here is really, really important. And this is also a little bit of the UNFCCC superpower in the sense that uh, today with the climate change challenge, one of the most front and center issues that we have is the natural action plans on climate action, what we call the national determined contributions. So every country now have one of those natural action plans. They need to become increasingly ambitious until we globally reach this target of reducing emissions 50% in the next eight years and then 100% until, until 2050. So what will then happen at COP? If I could have the last slide, please. So when we're coming to Glasgow, uh, as usual, there will be a lot of policy discussions and high level, high level, rather complicated, I would say, uh, <laughs> discussions that are difficult to understand if you're not really in the process. But we're also going to have a, a big spotlight on the private sector, on how the private sector and civil society can contribute to the work of the governments in reducing the, the global and the natural emissions. And we are going to use fashion as one of the sectors that we are using as an example. And why are we doing this? Well, first of all, because fashion, of course, is something that we all can relate to. We're all wearing clothes. We are all using fashion in different ways. So it's easy to understand what the problems are and what the solutions could be. Uh, more than that, also, uh, we are also um, looking for, uh, how can I say, we, we, we're looking at connecting the policymakers with the practitioners, with the real economy, uh, which we really think we can do through the natural action plans. Uh, and by, doing, by using the climate issue is a little bit of the engine that is driving the whole sustainability train 
for this sector. So we're very, very keen on, on getting this uh, into, into the uh, minds of policymakers with the help of the fashion sector itself. And being part of this, this um, the UN Fashion Alliance is, is very, very valuable uh, in that way to understand what's happening across the globe, to see all the other different you know, multifaceted uh, aspects that we have on this. It's not easy, it's going to be difficult, it's going to take time, but the mission here is really to save the planet. So that is why we're here and that is why we're very happy to move forward together with everybody else. Thank you so much, Lila. Wonderful, thank you very much, Nicholas. Very close to my heart, that particular initiative. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we have our final speaker now and I apologize in advance if I get your name wrong, <laughs> um, but we're gonna welcome Maryam Buamrani, I hope that's right, who is the section chief of the Research and Policy on Biodiversity Division of Ecological and Earth Sciences in UNESCO. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was correct, Leila. And uh, I'm sharing a room with Sylvie Benard uh, in, uh, in the IUCN Congress. That's why uh, you, you see her name below, but she's not far away. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the EMG Secretariat. Very nice to hear from the UN colleagues. I just wanted to share our ongoing uh, experience with the first uh, luxury group, Louis Vuitton, Wet NC, LVMH. With uh, UNESCO, we have uh, signed a partnership on biodiversity with LVMH a few years ago. And we are working together with this private group um, on uh, conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. All their <clears throat> different brands and, and houses uh, are completely dependent on biodiversity and they are aware of it. So they, they, they are really um, thinking uh, with the, uh, internally and with the support of UNESCO and how they can really be uh, transparent. It was a, a word that was said a lot, but also uh, committed to not destroy anymore the basis of our life on earth uh, because they are aware of their interdependency that their business is completely linked to the health of the planet and biodiversity. And they have, um, a strategy that we have, uh, that we are working with them on, which is Life 360, uh, which is based on four pillars uh, that were also uh, quite well uh, discussed here today on biodiversity, climate change, circular economy, uh, and transparency. Um, and what we do with them is what was also reflected by Sylvie Benard is to help them to have the data, the scientific analysis, the feasibility survey, um, it's uh, important that we use in the MAP program uh, the Biosphere Reserve, which are territory that are committed to sustainable development to achieve the SDG, and that are really places where people live and, uh, and inhabit, consume, produce, develop themselves. Um, we have 714 sites, a Biosphere Reserve in, in the world with, in 129 countries, and so with LVMH, we are using our 50 years experience because we are celebrating the 50 years of the MAP program to see what we have learned in terms of reconciliation between conservation and sustainable use, economic development and conservation of all the potential of uh, the living, the ecosystem, the genetic species, etc. So what we are working on together, and this is the link to the fashion, uh, is um, the, the source, the origin of the fabric, the, the products that they use, the supply chain, but we help them to look at the broader picture. So not only that the cotton is organic, but also, you know, how is the soil regenerated? What is the social impact on the communities? If they are, you know, uh, uh, having some producers locally, uh, who is benefiting from that uh, partnership and who is excluded from that partnership? What could be the other alternative, alternative land use? So in different biosphere reserve, we'll help them to assess that with our scientists and our expertise and with the local communities there. So this is an example they have, for example, in Turkey on soil regenerating agriculture for cotton, but we, we help them to look at the broader picture. Um, also reconciling conservation and sustainable use through some species that were like going extinct, like the Vigonia uh, in Peru. And so working with the um, with, um, uh, communities and the government of Peru, <clears throat> try to see how you can um, still sustainably use uh, some of the, uh, of the species like this Vigonia, this animal that they, that they take the, the, the wool from uh, in the, their brand, which is called um, Loropiania. And, and because of that, they were able to uh, transform a species that was going running extinct. Now it's raised and, and, and it's still uh, um, alive in Peru. 
And the final uh, example of this recycling and circular economy is this new platform that they have established uh, that is called Nona and where all the fabric that is not used uh, is going to be um, uh, given to young designer on the creativity side and uh, being able to, um, to be recycled and used in a different way and transform. So this is a long-term partnership we have with, with LVMH. It's touching different um, products, including fashion. But uh, again, I want to say that UNESCO is helping to provide the data, the scientific feasibility, the survey, and a holistic approach where you don't only focus on the supply and on the origin, but you look at the interaction between different alternative land use until the consumer that has to be informed in a transparent way about where it, come, it came from, how it was produced, and how this group can measure its impact on environment. And this is the final thing we are going to work with them uh, through, you, uh, through some, um, uh, with science, some scientists on the measurement on their impact. Uh, and you know, uh, just before me, there was uh, the climate change. Uh, it's easier to measure in a way, and it's complex in the biodiversity field to measure the impact of these enterprises. So we're going to help them also to merge that. And hopefully we can have some sound and reliable data on the impact on the fashion industry if we all work together. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So that concludes our panel sessions, um, or rather our speaking sessions. Now we will move to the panel discussion. Um, we will slightly make up the time, so we're slightly uh, running behind time. Um, essentially what we'll do now is there's a couple of different levels of questions. So there's micro level questions and then macro level questions. Um, and what we'll do is for each question, we'll ideally pick one or two speakers. And if speakers can keep their comments to about two minutes or less, that would be perfect. Um, each uh, panelist, if you'd like to raise your hand to ask a question, please do. I can see your hands going up and otherwise I will select somebody to answer the question. Uh, so the first question I really want to dive into is we've heard a lot of different content today, um, but one of the themes that has arisen is the effects that COVID-19 has had on the textiles value chain. Um, and in particular, in my work, I've observed how much impact this is having on SMEs and producers in the value chain. Um, so I wanted to, first of all, um, ask what kinds of support we can give to producers um, to address the financial sticking points that they're now facing so that they can still work on sustainability as a priority whilst ensuring their survival within this value chain. Um, so I might first ask Elizabeth if she has any specific comments on support that she can provide or the UN can provide. Many thanks. Uh, did you mean me as this Elizabeth? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think very pertinent question because what we've seen is really the falling apart of, of the value chains. On the one hand, in terms of like transport connections falling apart, and secondly, obviously, also demand falling apart. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I guess one uh, element where the UN can really come in and where this initiative on sustainable fashion can come in would be to uh, provide reassurance and to allow for sustainable products at a higher price and at a higher value to basically fill the gap that we currently have. And uh, I think the current situation is uh, an, a call for all of us to not only continue business as usual, but to really build back better, better. And here that's uh, a call to move to sustainable production, sustainable consumption, and uh, basically helping the small scale producers along the value chain to do that. So not just continue doing what they've been doing, but really helping them to upgrade to new production patterns. Wonderful. Thank you, Elizabeth. And Simone, I think you, same question to you. Yeah, the, the point on our side is if you want to enable producers, especially in the global south, uh, and the majority of the supply chain of the industry of fashion is in the global south, but even in the north, producers to cope with uh, the issue of sustainability, you have to, first of all, uh, have a value chain approach to bring in also the brands and the distributors and to have schemes of due diligence that bring together the brands and distributors on one side and the producers on the other side. We are producers. That's the reason why in the elaboration of our ESG due diligence scheme, we brought in also the brands and the distributors. 
uh, if you are not on the same page on this, on due diligence, on uh, spotting the ESG risks, it's impossible for a producer to be sustainable. Secondly, there is a financial implication. Many of these producers uh, operate in places where the cost of capital is much higher than in uh, uh, Europe or in the US, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, let's say, richer economies. In some of the places where we work, the cost of capital is around 25% on an annual basis, which is excessive. There is no way to cope with it if you work in fashion. Now, skipping uh, uh, being sustainable means also having a capacity to invest. And it's not only, it's long-term investment, it's CapEx, but it's also investment on restructuring. And it's also some form of investment, even of short-term investment on working capital. This requires the brands and the uh, distributors who work with these producers to make financial facilities available. Otherwise, the cost of investment for sustainability is all on producers who face the worst financing conditions. Financing sustainability is an issue, is a global issue, and is an issue that uh, implies the engagement of brands and distributors to invest, to support the investment of the producers along the supply chain. I repeat, producers alone, given the cost of capital in many of the places where they work, are not able, uh, are not always able to do it. Mm. So this is something that requires a network approach. And this is why the tool for ESG reporting and due diligence must be a tool that has this uh, capacity to reach the two ends of the value chain. Thank you very much, Simone. That's perfect. And I agree with you, we can't expect them to act on their own. <laughs> they definitely need support. Um, so building on that question, actually not building on that question, a completely separate question. We saw from Simone, that's why it made me think of it, uh, that the um, UN has carried out this mapping of different UN activities around textiles. So really seeing all the different initiatives going on under the UN umbrella. Um, so Essentially, I'm curious to know what people found were best practices that they learned out of that mapping exercise for engaging either policymakers or the private sector. Um, and any other sort of observations about actually how that exercise is going to help you coordinate your activities within the UN. If nobody wants to put their hand up, I will also pounce on people. <laughs> ah, Margarita, yes, please go ahead. Yes. Um... Well, if I can say maybe uh, from, from the ILO point of view, what really we found worked is, uh, first of all, initiative where you have uh, a multi-level engagement. So it's not just about talking to government, for sure the government needs to ensure an enabling environment regulation, but also talking to the brands, but also talking to employers organization that are not the brand themselves, but they represent the small and medium enterprises, the suppliers, they may provide them with services, for example, to build the viability of, uh, of a specific business and, uh, and naturally the, the unions. I always have the impression that the unions are always uh, um, not considered in this discussion, but uh, I find that if we don't involve the unions, we are going to have a social conflict, you know, restructuring, economic restructuring mm -hmm. as a result of COVID or non-COVID, beyond COVID, uh, may result in many of these workers displaced. So a very important initiative that really involved the, the unions. Uh, and then uh, uh, also initiative that combine a bit different policy level from employment, fiscal, trade environmental policy. We need to make sure this policy talk to each other and some of the initiative really proved very effective. And maybe last but not the least, uh, um, initiative that tried to create a bit of a dialogue between consumption and production countries. Um, the narrative around environmental sustainability is uh, often uh, um, taken over by consumption countries. I think we should uh, start to also have a dialogue between production and consumption countries. Thank you very much, Margarita. Um, I'm going to go to Liani and then Simone, I'll maybe give you a very brief intervention, but you have spoken already, so it'll be very brief. Uh, Leonie, no, Le Leonie speaks for me too, so uh, I move my hand. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Leonie. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Simona. Well, I just wanted to um, say, perhaps from the perspective of, uh, of authoring the report, um, I think it was it was really important to basically start the conversation and with this overview of who is doing what and where and how all of these initiatives um, that the UN is already doing, um, how they relate to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. I think it was it was really just to kind of start the conversation, not to to analyze too much, uh, you know, best practices. I mean, there are a couple of best practices listed there, for example, um, ways that uh, the UN engages member states, but also um, through formalized multi-stakeholder um, platforms. Uh, one of them, I mean, yeah, one of them, for example, the Mongolian Sustainable Cla uh, Kashmir platform um, that UN UNDP is conducting or the Conscious Fashion and Lifestyle Network uh, that UNOP has. Um, I mean, there's, there's loads of examples like these, and I think we can all learn from them by looking at, you know, how they, how they basically engage members and how they engage stakeholders. Um, but also from, from this mapping, a couple of initiatives uh, um, emerged themselves. So um, Paula briefly mentioned this, uh, this collaboration between UNEC and ITC, um, and also actually all members of the UN Alliance um, on an informal dialogue with the government of Moldova. And I think that's like kind of the examples that we want to see more in the future of um, really engaging member states because that's that's kind of our basis. Um, and, and the UN, you know, pro providing a, a platform for, for everyone to come together. So um, yeah, I'm gonna post the, the link to the report in the, in the chat in case you haven't had the chance to look at it. But um, yeah, thanks for bringing up over to you. Yep. Thank you so much, Diony. It was a very interesting exercise, so it's <laughs> great to connect with you. Um, okay, so my next question is connected. It's really thinking about, given the breadth of what's happening across the UN on textiles and all the nuances of the programmes, are there ways in which we can help to coordinate better or, or more strongly within between UN agencies? And what kind of structures, if any, do we need to actually make that happen? Um, I might actually go to Bettina on this one, Bettina. <laughs> Sure, I'm happy to have a go, and I, I'm sure the colleagues can complement. Um, so definitely, and I mean, we know that in our everyday job, we're always trying to coordinate and to, to talk to everyone and know what's going on, but sometimes also it just falls between the cracks because so many other things come up. And so I think this uh, report with the mapping was a really good starting point. Um, we also had some sort of internal meetings where each agency would present what they're doing. And even I think the meeting today really helps again to even hear, I heard from your agencies where I was not yet aware. So it's, it's really good to have these sort of dialogues. Um, I think the way forward is really, um, so as Leonie already said, our um, entry point to the member states, I think what's also interesting is that probably each of us has a different entry point also in the governments, different ministries that we would rather talk to, so sort of combining that can already be interesting. And I think then it is to really help the, the weakest in the system, so to say. Um, so I think we already heard about that also, um, that especially SMEs in developing and transition economies um, really need support. And um, I think there, this is also something that uh, with the whole UN reform, and this is not only about fashion textiles, but there is the whole reform ongoing where we're trying to better um, basically combine our offer and offer that um, to, to the member states based on the needs that they have identified. So this could also help um, from that aspect. But um, yeah, I think in general, also from all the consultations that we have held, coordination seems to be the, the big missing piece. Um, and I think, um, yeah, venues like this are a really good starting point. And then we just need to really coordinate in concrete projects going forward. Perfect, thank you, Bettina. Sorry, can I also come in on this? Yes, Paula, please go ahead. Sorry, I'm desperately looking for the little uh, yellow hand, but I guess this is not team, so I don't find a way. <laughs> Sorry for being my bro. Well, just, just to, uh, actually echo what Bettina said. I think we should not forget that this UN alliance is the first time the UN comes together on a voluntary basis. And we have coordinated for the last few years. Um, there are similar initiatives like UN Water, you, you're all aware of, but this were not, uh, it was not a volu they were not voluntarily 
created by UN staff. They were actually invited by member states. So I think the first success of the alliance is that we came together um, because we realized that we only deal with a little piece of the cake and the entire cake is with none of our organizations. It's only by coming together, we really have a, an overview and a good picture of what's happening right there. Now, I think the problem now is to how to strengthen our presence, uh, how to make it more effective. I think that having a website has already helped a lot. Having social media has already helped a lot. And uh, the first most important step for the future is really to enhance communication amongst us, because that's where I really see honestly and frankly, and those who know me know that I'm very direct in saying this, but we don't even coordinate um, you know, often within our own organization. So it's even more difficult sometimes to coordinate with others. This is a great platform. It should be used by everybody. Nobody's better than others. We all doing a piece of the, we all have a piece of the cake and we cannot pretend that we are addressing the whole issue. So uh, being a bit more humble and just to cooperate with colleagues uh, to make sure that we also support what others are doing. And as I said, perhaps taking the opportunities offered by UN events, because after all, we are UN. Uh, so when we organize UN events also to, to make member states more, more aware of what's happening out there. Of course, there is the whole issue of the private sector. And I think this is a Pandora's box. I would not like to touch it upon now because they are the ones that really make a difference. And initiatives like this uh, uh, EMG, uh, sorry, this, this uh, um, uh, due diligence that uh, Simone, for instance, starting hopefully with the Alliance is a way to talk to the private sector. But our role is primarily to go out to member states and make sure they understand the relevance that this sector has because unfortunately it's probably the one that has spoken less about sustainability so far. The fact that Greater Thunberg was on vogue gives us some hope uh, that that will be higher on international agenda, but uh, uh, probably we have to be louder and make sure that our member states are more involved through whatever initiative we, we, have, we are starting. Thank you. Thank you, Bella. Um, so my next question is really, one about the limits of how the UN can act. So obviously the UN is an extremely powerful organization, but to your point, Paula, the private sector and lots of other kind of actors also have a strong role to play in the transition that we're looking for. So I'm curious if anybody wants to, yes, yeah, Simone, you have things to say about this, but you know, I really want to, interesting uh, topic to dive into. What should the UN um, be not trying to take on and what are the limits of, of where that, activity should sit and how do you then hand over responsibility to other actors um i think simone i'll go to you but also i really want to hear from sophia because she did that analysis of the role of different actors in the in the push to sustainability so simone maybe to you quickly and then to sophia the un system shouldn't reinvent the wheel mm. uh, the things that already exist and the experiences that already exist in sustainability and so on are there. The industry knows how to do things. If the industry doesn't do them, it's because they deliberately choose not to do them. So our work is to push, to create a framework, to push the industry and to also hold them accountable. And one thing that we could do all together is also to define once and for all and this is also an agreement with the private sector, and this is also a message of the UN Alliance for Sustainable Fashion, the meaning of the main claims that we hear from the industry. You know, if you just stick to the environment, today you have a lot of claims, net zero, net zero, carbon negative, circularity, lifetime carbon neutral, climate neutral, carbon neutral, and everybody uses them in different ways. To have one meaning, to have one clear definition for everything so that there is also clarity on the claims that in the private sector, uh, you, you, you hear from the private sector and there is alignment in, in our work. Again, Paula, thank you. The UN Alliance is there for that. Thank you so many. Sophia, do you have anything you want to share with us about what you think could be done to 
um, clearly demarcate what the UN takes on versus what other actors take on? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say for me, you know, from the youth perspective and also working in this realm, we firmly believe that the um, focus on equity and justice is incredibly important in the textiles value chain, especially as it pertains to labor rights and the fact that most workers in the garment sector are in the global south. I too felt that when I was at global conferences, you know, in different sessions, you don't see enough garment workers, union workers being represented in these spaces. And that's something that we're increasingly concerned about because although many young people do feel the private sector has this increased amount of power, there's a lack of transparency, there's a lack of understanding. And as Simone mentioned, this, um, these many different terms and the fancy words make it cloudier to understand what is really happening. And I feel that nonprofits and those civil societies have done a great job at you know pushing the limits in terms of activism and you know you can cancel brands you can not choose to buy from them but we know that there's so much more we can do rather than just voting with our dollars and it's really imperative to remember that you know you coming together and realizing what's possible there has to be legislation whether that's extended producer responsibility policy the government's mandate there has to be better legislation for local levels of production and, we, and with COVID, with a global awakening, I think it's imperative that we look at the current system and see ways that we can involve each other that is not just ping pong responsibility between government, between industry, between consumers, but actually having a true collaborative nature and what, how we can reimagine fashion. You know, I've seen great organizations like State of Fashion and also Vogue even come up with new challenges, but there is a collective definition and a refusal of ping pong responsibility that needs to happen. You know, but we know for us to truly get to where we want to be. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sophia. Uh, there's two different directions I could go with this now. So, I'm, I'm <laughs> so I think what I'll do first is um, maybe quickly check in. Oh, Nicholas, you had your hand up. Please go ahead. Well, thank, thank you. Just first of all, supporting everything that was already said here. Uh, I think it's, it's absolutely true. It's very important to keep all the social equity and justice in mind when we're working in this sector, because it's such a big issue in this sector. But to your questions also on what should we do and what should we not do. Um, so in the fashion charter, we do work directly with the industry. And what we have learned, I have personally learned, is the many, many different you know, realities for different stakeholders in the value change that we as UN officials may not always be fully aware about. And in terms of what are the challenges for a producer in China? What are the challenges for a big brand in the United States? What are the, what are the uh, challenges for a small um, manufacturer in Italy. Um, these things are something that I think we can help each other to understand. Um, and by understanding that, we can also remove the barriers for improving the different aspects of this sector. However, I do think that the sector has to do this job themselves. We can help them to connect with finance, with policymakers, with technology providers, with civil society, that we can't go in and do the job for them. This is something that the sector will have to do themselves. And I must say, my experience from working with many, many of these private sector stakeholders is that there really is a big appetite among many of them to take this step forward. So I'm quite optimistic that we can do something good here, but uh, you know, within the right perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Perfect. Um, I'll quickly pivot to just transition because it's come up repeatedly and I think it's a really interesting one in terms of it, it is a concept that combines environmental and social um, content, which is quite new for a lot of us working in sustainability. Um, so I know Margarita, you had an extensive presentation about kind of the role of, of uh, climate justice, but do you have any um, recommendations for how we can better facilitate the links between the environmental and social knowledge bases and how that would then um, be sort of seen in the work of the UN itself? Yes, I think that the just transition is more an umbrella concept than it, it, it also implies also reflecting a bit about the redistribution uh, in a society of the benefit. Uh, so looking at the specific policies around sector policies that look at the different dimensions, social, economic, environmental dimension, reviving a bit the concept of industrial policies, looking what sector need and the, what the stakeholders in sector need, um, not just about the businesses, but also about workers and the government. This is one point. The second is about uh, looking at uh, um, a bit of a balancing act uh, and a new social contract within the countries. 
uh, how do we make sure when we talk about just transition, how we unpack all this concept? What does it mean, for example, a shift into environmental sustainability? What are the type of policy that we need in terms of skills, in terms of social protection, uh, of social security, broader, uh, broader issues about social security? And what are the, uh, the enterprise level action that we need in terms of enabling environment for small and medium enterprises? So it's a bit, a bit unpacking this umbrella concept. Uh, otherwise, we risk it that we lose uh, ourselves uh, in, uh, in something that looks very theoretical in reality is really looking at all these issues and naturally social dialogue. We need to have a dialogue between the different parties. And probably social dialogue built into the more traditional environmental concepts and, and yeah. programs as well. Which is absolutely. at the moment there's still a gap. Mm, absolutely yeah so the final question I want to ask and I'll ask a few of you if I can is really about we've heard a lot about measurement and data and concepts and then obviously we know that there's a huge urgency for action on all the issues that we're trying to address here so I'm curious to know from a few of you where do you think the balance lies between those two things and if there was maybe one thing that you felt that as a UN system or initiative you could do that would really create rapid and meaningful change, what would that one thing be that maybe is not already happening? Um, I'm going to jump on the people over this. So maybe Sylvie, we haven't heard from you yet. Would you like to give that one a go first? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to say uh, what I already said. Uh, for me, uh, maybe because I'm a scientist, uh, the data is absolutely needed, absolutely needed. If you take a carbon uh, emission, you have figures with 2% and you have figures with 10%. What is the right one? If you don't know what's the right one, we're going to work maybe on the wrong issue and not on the real hotspot. So data, data, data. Reliable and without bias. Hi, hey. <laughs> uh, maybe Bettina, would you like to go? Sure. Um, to keep it short, yeah, I agree <laughs> with Sylvie. I think data is very important. I think if we speak about the UN's role, I think often the problem is also that data is either not available for free or, you know, it's not really clear where it came from, what kind of peer review processes went through. So I think we can bring out sort of, um, yeah, just our role uh, in, in having really good information and good data, making it openly available. Um, and I think that's the role we can all play. Absolutely. Uh, we have a hand up from Maria Teresa Pisani, Maria, and then. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. And just to build on uh, what uh, Sylvie and uh, Bettina um, uh, were mentioning, um, definitely together with sustainability, I would say digitalization is the other disruptive transformation that is going to deeply affect. Um, the industry and the production and consumption patterns in the industry. And the main challenge uh, from our perspective here is really to make sure that uh, uh, both producers, consumers have the right tools uh, uh, to go more for more responsible choices on materials, but also on products uh, and to address greenwashing. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, false sustainability claims, uh, greenwashing around sustainability claims has been uh, really at the heart of the project that Elisa that presented uh, and that you and EC were doing on uh, traceability and transparency of value chains. That's the main uh, purpose. Now, advanced technologies like blockchain uh, uh, are definitely promising and uh, can be an extraordinary, extraordinary enabler for transparent, open, innovative, and efficient value chains. And this is something that the G20, uh, the digital ministers of the G20 just reaffirmed and stressed actually the importance that the digital transformation can bring in terms of uh, more aware consumer choices. So uh, technology at the same time, this is something that uh, also was stressed, can improve ac market access for SMEs. Uh, and we have seen that actually happening also during the COVID pandemic. Um, 
especially for the SMEs that are starting to embrace sustainability and comply uh, in a reliable uh, and trusted way uh, with environmental and social requirements. Uh, and that demand more and more a le level playing field. So here, I mean, the role of policymakers and regulators and the UN, I mean, helping actually to establish that level playing field that can incentivize, you know, the good and sustainable uh, practices. Now, based uh, with the uh, engagement uh, our engagement with industry players, and we have engaged a lot uh, uh, on the government side, but also exactly with the private sector and with industry players uh, uh, in our action. Um, including uh, uh, through our work on the blockchain system that we have actually developed as part of the project, I would like to share a few points when it comes to uh, what needs to be done uh, to harness uh, the potential of the digital transformation and to make sure that can, it can go hand in hand with the sustainability uh, transformation. So first of all, is the Just commitment- yeah. Probably one minute because we're very at low on yeah. time now. It's just uh, three points, the commitment and collaboration of all the actors along the value chain. And this is something that has proved uh, to be quite challenging. So uh, creating that enabling environment and governance uh, uh, framework to uh, help that collaboration and uh, uh, engagement of all the actors is something very important. Then the need for open source inclusive solutions and to build capacity, especially for the SMEs in emerging economies. And then creating, uh, let's say, the, um, the standards uh, and um, and the tools uh, to allow interoperability uh, among existing solutions. Uh, actually, it was mentioned, a lot is already there, but we need to make it in the interoperable. We need to ensure that these solutions and the systems can talk to, uh, to each other and, and, uh, and are in, interconnected. And data privacy and data security is definitely an issue that we have been facing in the implementation of our blockchain system. So standards, regulations, norms on data privacy and data security is also something that uh, needs to be addressed and is an important concern when it comes to data sharing um, around sustainability um, claims. Yeah, that's in a nutshell on, uh, on my side. Thank you very much. Um, we're almost out of time, so maybe I will just go to Carolina because I don't think you've spoken. On Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I just uh, wanted to um, say from the point of view of UNCTAD, as I said before, we tried to uh, enhance the understanding of the economic contribution of these creative industries in um, trade and development. Uh, so we um, do um, have a, a database. We collect data from different uh, uh, sources and, and uh, we try to see um, the weight of design industries, including fashion industries. And of course, uh, it's a big challenge uh, to say uh, where are these uh, fashion, uh, where does where is the conceptualization, where is the design done? Uh, so uh, for us, it's, it's very important to be able to uh, build on what we have in terms of data systems, which are already available in the UN, but that really need to be improved. We have little data from developing countries in terms of what they are producing and exporting. So. Uh, I think that, um, of course, uh, once we are able to, to, to collect more data, uh, we can measure uh, the impact that they have uh, in terms of uh, incomes for people and how the trends in the industry, and, and of course, develop that into a, a more um, a specific uh, level of uh, including these um, which are the, the fashion that, which is the fashion that uh, it integrates uh, more, um, uh, how should I say, fabrics that are uh, sustainable, uh, ethical fashion, all of these new concepts, which now uh, we don't take them into account because we basically don't have this data. But the point that I want to make is there are data systems and it would be very good if we can complement those. This is why I see the value of working uh, with this alliance in order to understand the trends, in, in order to see the new regulatory frameworks, uh, the new, uh, uh, what you call the due diligence systems or criterias. 
so that we can also evolve in terms of reporting the, the data that, uh, that we are producing. And also I wanted to uh, bring out uh, another aspect. Uh, we're trying to see a lot of relationship with creative industries and digitalization. We see that a lot of the fashion uh, is being consumed uh, through online internet. So, um, I, you know, uh, it's very important that somehow uh, we have, uh, uh, we elaborate actually on, on how we can work with these platforms. How can we, uh, and many of the youth actually are, are the biggest consumers, are, are the biggest, uh, uh, they have a great potential to, to um, promote these new brands because they, 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 they are more sensitive to these uh, environmentally friendly uh, fashion uh, goods and products. So I think these, mm -hmm. these uh, three uh, aspects uh, somehow are really uh, linked. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that just looking at, at, at one side, uh, probably uh, it would only give one dimension. So the idea is how we can include and, and develop these partnerships in order to be able to, to sustain uh, this collaboration. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Carolina. So, uh, uh, we Laila, don't just, time. just one word, Laila, just one word. I'm sorry, yeah. everybody. Let's, um, an appeal, an appeal. Let's uh, try to stop telling the industry what they already know to do better than us uh, and teaching them to do what they already do or what they can do if they want well reporting and so on they can do it they can do it well the work we are doing with them proves it they are they can if you stimulate them it goes let's tell the industry it's the moment to make choices the choice to be sustainable is the choice not on how i speak to people they speak even too much of what they do but it's the choice to make things in a sustainable way and they know how to do it if we are able to push the industry with all our work towards that, we change the world for the better. And the industry, Nicholas is right, is absolutely right. The industry wants to do it. I know a lot of managers in this industry who want to do it. If we are mentor to them and, to, and we facilitate what they want to do, if we enable them to make the choices, guys, we change the world for the better. Our power is huge and I shut up forever. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simone. There's a great note to end on. Um, I was gonna do a big summary. I'm not gonna do very much of that at all, but I would just say it's very clear as a sort of semi-outsider that the UN is a kind of at a pivot point with their work on textiles, where you have this huge opportunity for coordination, for cross-fertilization, and for really defining your value-add role in the system. And I think the clear sense seems to be that the UN is here as a convener, as a policy engager to help with definitions and data, um, but that the other actors need to also play a strong implementing role. And so really recognizing the limits and boundaries and those um, the need to consult and understand the limits of other actors is gonna be absolutely crucial. Um, on that note, I will finally hand over to um, Mr. Hussain Badai for closing remarks. Thank you very much. I think you might be muted, Mr. Fede. Apologize, you're muted. Okay, great. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank, thank you, Leila. Thank you, colleagues and friends. Uh, this has been a fascinating, educative uh, discussion for me, at least. Um, and uh, uh, basically, uh, I, I have a lot in my head. I, I need to decompose. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, contributions and a lot of points that uh, uh, were brought around the table. Um, it's not easy to uh, sort of conclude such a session uh, so quickly, but I, I, I can promise you that we would really uh, work on the minutes of, of this discussion with uh, Nina. There is a lot of uh, aspects to decompose relating to um, the conceptual dimensions of the sustainable fashion, the you know practical and uh, more sort of hands-on related issues to this topic based on the experiences that you brought around the table. Simone mentioned 
aspects that the, you know the industry is well informed uh, they are sometimes even uh, far advanced than yuan itself in terms of sustainability we have seen this in the area of for example e-waste management uh, where we brought a lot of uh, these private companies around together around the table with, with, with the UN agencies and realized, as a matter of fact, they are quite uh, uh, far advanced than, than the UN itself in, in sustainability reporting, for instance. But the key question is how do you actually, um, um, within this economic uh, sort of uh, choice that they um, take, uh, you can actually make a compelling argumentation that uh, sustainability will actually will increase their economic benefits while also obviously uh, helping the society and uh, you know uh, the human rights related issues uh, so it's it's all about that and we have some experiences we have some lessons learned from other sectors that we can share uh, obviously the, the the issue of um, governance it's it, it's a very uh, mysterious issue in this very complex nexus of uh, sustainable fashion for me. I thought the food uh, nexus is the most complex, but I realized that we have even a more complex one uh, in, the, in the area of fashion. Uh, but the, the, the food, uh, we knew that there are some actors such as, for example, the Fowl Food Program and the others, uh, which this issue belongs to their main mandate. But in the area of fashion, sustainable fashion, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, and for me, it would be very interesting to look at this governance, benefit from, from the report that UNEP has issued recently, uh, mapping all these actors and then try to see where are the gaps uh, and then how can we strengthen the environmental aspects even from a governance perspective and coordination perspective. So just to say that, we are taking a lot of these inputs uh, in our uh, thinking. We would share with you the, the, the minutes of this. We would very much appreciate, some of you have said it, but it would be very appreciated to understand what more expectations do you have from the EMG, especially from the environmental point of view, to help this um, coordination be improved. Uh, and, and obviously, EMG is not a long-term platform for coordination on these issues. We are there to facilitate and to make sure that if there are some actors who have not been engaged, they can be invited uh, and then can be engaged and then pass it over to uh, the existing platforms to, to continue on that issue within their expertise. Um, so we are here to, to support. Um, we would be very happy to focus on the specific aspects of the sustainable fashion, environmental dimensions in particular. Uh, and, and then uh, happy to support uh, all of you um, engaged. Um, you, as you have seen it in our website, there is a, already plenty of information and links that Nina has uh, put on, on, on the EMG webpage. It's already a good uh, volume of information. Will that contribute to uh, helping uh, exchange of knowledge as, as um, Paola referred to with all means and uh, why not? And, and will the EMG, could the EMG contribute the specific environmental aspects of the fashion, sustainable fashion in its future dialogues and discussions? Why not? Can we support uh, enhancing coordination in this field, benefiting from the senior officials of the EMG in the future to enhance the governance aspects? Why not? So all in your hands, just give us your feedback, especially Simone and Paola and the other colleagues in the UNC. I know that a lot of you have been already pioneering uh, actions in this area. We are in your hands to, to support your uh, future actions and, and, and work in this domain. Over to you and uh, Nina, I don't know if there is anything else I should say, but just thanking again all of the colleagues and uh, wishing and hoping and looking forward to continuation of this exchange with all of you. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is nothing further. Just a gentle reminder that everything will be on the landing page. If you wish to send me additional background documents, I'm at your disposal. Have a good day ahead, all of you. Um, morning, afternoon, and evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. So yes. Bye-bye.